Good morning. We're here at uh, STS to talk about the topic of total arterial revascularization, which is very relevant as new guidelines will be uh, coming out shortly. And we have uh, two of the world's experts on the topic here with us today. So I'll be your moderator, Todd Rosengard. I'm chairman of surgery at Baylor College of Medicine, and I uh, look forward to uh, having this uh, uh, be a very informative session and would like to introduce my two colleagues. Joe? Uh, hi, I'm Joe Savick. I'm chairman of the Department of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. Steve? Yeah, I'm Stephen Freems. I'm Bernard Goldman Chair of Cardiovascular Surgery at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, Toronto. Great, thank you. Let's jump right in. So Joe, why don't I start with you. Um, who is a candidate for total arterial revascularization and how do you decide? Well, that's a great question. You know, I think when we think about heart surgery, I think that's what the first question we have to ask is who should we be doing total arterial revascularization in and who should we not? You know, today, the more we learn about arterial grafts, the more we know they're beneficial, not only in helping patients uh, stay alive, but also be free of angina, heart attacks, you know, recurrent symptoms. So the more effective operations we want to do, the more arterial revascularization we need to do. You know, therefore, I find myself doing more and more arterial grafts. When it comes to total arterial revascularization, obviously that's a large, complex operation. And we mostly do that in our younger patients with uh, you know, very diffuse disease. Um, but what's young today is uh, expanding. Great, Steve? Yeah, I would concur with Joe. Um, the, someone who's of elderly age, and elderly I would say is more than 80, would probably not be a candidate in general unless there's reasons why they can't have um, venous conduits for one reason or another. I think we look at, uh, but similar to Joe, we look at someone who's going to have a long life after them. And if we can sort of estimate as a clinician uh, whose survival is like to be at least 10 years, then we have to think uh, about total arterial vascularization for that person. So there's been a lot of information uh, studies that have been um, better and worse. There have been some classic studies from Cleveland Clinic. Joe, what, what do you think is the best data supporting the use of total arterial revascularization in general or perhaps even specifically? Well, you know, there's not that much data, to be honest with you, on total arterial revascularization. I think we have a lot of data on the benefits of more than one arterial graft. We know that the use of an IMA has its greatest effect by the end of the first decade. But in patients, as we know, that are going to live uh, longer uh, than 10 years, that second arterial graft seems to make a difference in terms of survival and freedom from reintervention or recurrent symptoms. We know that adding a radial artery graft onto an internal thoracic artery graft helps patients, uh, you know, do better. And I think it's just we kind of follow this logically. One is good, two is better. Why not in our young patients with a good longevity, particularly someone who vein grafts may not work well, hyperlipidemic, why aren't we doing more arterial grafts to give them better long-term results? Not just survival, uh, but freedom from symptoms and other ischemic events. So I think the data is good. It's observational, obviously. We don't have great randomized long-term studies. But the one thing that I think we have to admit that all the observational studies point in the same direction. You know, there aren't studies that show that multiple arterial grafts hurt patients. And so, again, I think the data is good. It's not that strong and that it's not randomized, but it's overwhelming. Great. Steve, you concur? I concur. Uh, um, the studies that are support uh, total arterial re revascularization have generally been observational. The RCTs have been quite small, and the follow-ups have been relatively short. Um, the other thing we have to remember is there is a big bang for the buck for a second arterial graft. And uh, the additional benefit of a third arterial graft is likely more limited. So um, I think that speaks to the fact that the studies would have to be even larger or the duration of follow-up even longer to uh, show uh, a benefit, at least statistically. Great. So Steve, Joe mentioned uh, we won't harm our patients. Um, do you concur? Is there, is there any risk associated with total arterial? I mean, obviously there is an increased risk of wound infection, or perhaps yeah. you don't agree with that. H how do you break that down? Well, uh, to start with radials, there isn't really a big downside to using a radial. Most surgeons who use them use it from the non-dominant hand. There's a, a fraction of patients who get uh, non-specific neurological complications afterwards, but um, these are generally temporary. Ischemic issues related to the hand are exceedingly rare. 
Um, the other, though, is uh, bilateral IMAs, or ITAs. And in that, there is a concern about increased risk of sternal infection. That's been shown both uh, in randomized studies and, more importantly, in observational studies. But uh, a lot of work has gone into trying to identify, of those people, who is most at risk. And, and particularly uh, uh, in uh, one of last year's issues of the JTCVS uh, from Cleveland Clinic, there was a very great work in, uh, about the, uh, the risks in diabetics. But even that, which diabetics have the highest risk? And maybe Joe wants to follow up on that. So where do you draw the line, Joe? Who would you not um, consider for a total arterial? So I think you're asking me really about where does the risk become you know, prohibitive? And one of the things we were very interested in in the, in the study that was just talked about was what diabetic population of patients where is the risk of sternal wound infection so high that you really do not want to use bilateral internal thoracic artery graft? And obviously we found that it was related to size. You know, the larger the patient, the more overweight the patient, not, not larger, but overweight patient, the higher the risk of infection. And that was particularly true in women. You know, their risk was higher. But one of the things that surprised us at any level, the survival benefit was still there. So despite the fact that the patient might develop a wound infection, they still seem to derive a survival benefit. Now obviously wound infections can be devastating, and so you really do have to temper your use in that patient population. Diabetic, obese patients, particularly um, you know, women, I think you really have to, this is where the informed consent is really important and a, and a very, very important dis a discussion in using. I think the other thing is, you know, in the, in the very elderly, you know, a study done by uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Bruce Lytle, when he was looking at that, trying to figure out when th do bilateral mammaries not help patients. And it wasn't really until you got to the age of 80 that you actually started to see some survival decrement. Great. So let me uh, stay with you. Um, what does your total arterial revascularization look like? Where does the ma right mammary go? Where do you put the radial? What do you do with the uh, lima? Sure. So. The first thing I think about is obviously is how we're going to use the left internal mammary artery. And that goes to the anterior surface of the heart, maybe to the diagonal and LED. I'll take the right internal mammary and then use that to what I believe is the next most important uh, coronary arteries. Often that is used as a sequential graft, as a composite graft to circumflex branches. We'll often use the radial to fill in left-sided gaps. The right coronary artery is always a little bit of a problem for us because, as you know, the effects of competitive flow are really pronounced in the right coronary artery. So when I'm using an arterial graft to the right coronary artery, it has to have a high grade obstruction. And I think our options, obviously, are the, the radial or the gastroepiploic in that situation. If the circumflex is small and diminutive um, and the right coronary artery has a severe obstruction, I will use the right internal mammary artery uh, to the distal right or PDA. So I can't leave, let you off the hook on that. How often are you using gastroepiploics? Not often. Um, you know, I think the anatomy has to be very good. So we're talking about uh, high-grade obstruction, and I'm using the radial somewhere else. Great. Steve, what does your, what does your uh, anatomy look like uh, on a total arterial? I would say I'd, I'm a little different than Joe in that my first, uh, my first two thoughts is where I'm going to put the rema and uh, where I'm going to put the radial. And for the rema, uh, I try and use it in situ, and uh, it's either to the LAD territory or the lateral wall. If it's to the lateral wall through the transverse sinus, it's usually to a high obtuse marginal as opposed to a more distant obtuse marginal. And if it's to the LAD, it's more the mid-LAD as opposed to the distal LAD. So if someone has fairly diffuse disease in the LAD, then they typically would need a lima as opposed to a rema, and the rema has to go to the lateral wall. As far as the radial, that uh, in studies we've done, as well as others, we show that it has to go to a very high-grade stenosis, that 70% is probably not adequate. Um, so what's, what's the number? Well, we use 90. Now, as you mentioned the right coronary. Frequently, the right is 100%. A total right is a very common scenario in someone with triple vessel disease, so, so that is a good option. And it certainly reaches quite well compared to the rema in the right territory. So uh, we feel comfortable putting the radial to the right, provided it is a very high-grade lesion. Uh, so getting back to your original question, frequently it is two mammaries to the left coronary circulation, and the radial is to the right. 
Um, that would be the most common scenario. So where, Steve, do you uh, view the role of uh, antispasmodic med medications now? There's been some shift in uh, thinking about that. Yeah. Well, uh, we use them routinely perioperatively, and uh, we've always dis discharged patients on calcium channel blockers, which in our institutions usually been the fetapine, a more pr powerful per peripherally active one as opposed to diltiazem. Um, I'm aware, as most surgeons are, that there's little evidence to support that to long term, but uh, we still use it. Um, I think uh, short term, around the time of surgery, there's much more evidence to support it, both uh, bench work and clinical work. But again, it's, um, it's more anecdotal than, than supported by strong clinical evidence. Okay, so um, let, me, uh, let me ask you a follow-up question in terms of your anatomy. We've counted, uh, I count three graphs so far, two mammaries and a radial. What if uh, you have additional bypasses to do? How do you approach that? Well, I'm not as aggressive at uh, going beyond three graphs um, as Joe is. Um, the LED diagonal is something that I'll sequence. I usually don't sequence the lateral wall with an arterial graft unless it's a radial. And uh, I think a radial is a very comfortable graft to use as a sequential graft. Uh, but once you get into the four and five um, anastomotic numbers, often we supplement that with a pain graft. Great. How about you, Joe? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great point. The more arterial grafts you're doing, obviously, the more difficult the operation. I think one of the things we it's also important to consider while you're doing your operation is the quality of your grafts, the quality of the distals, where you're going to do your anastomosis. For instance, if you're sequencing two circumflexes with a, a free rema graft, you know, you need to make sure that where you're grafting them is where you want to graft them. You can't compromise. And the, and the rema has to be of an adequate size. Um, so I think that all these things kind of the judgment goes into the operation. So you do have to be somewhat flexible uh, with your operative plan. Um, so let me ask you a, diff a different sort of approach to this. Um, have you ever changed decision making based upon the quality of the vein grafts? So, and how do you decide that? Uh, well, let's say that I, I have been in the situation where it's an elderly patient where I'm only planning on using one mammary and the vein is very bad. You know, we find out that it's sclerotic or very large. And then I think then you have to consider using all uh, other arterial grafts as opposed to using bad vein grafts. So um, let me see if I could get you to expand on that. What makes a bad vein graft? So I think one of the things to consider is a very large vein. You know, some patients that uh, you know surprise you have an eight, 10 millimeter vein. Every once in a while you get there and you find that the vein wall is, is very thick and you open it and it looks like possibly they might have had uh, thrombus in it that's healed and you can kind of see old scarring in the vein. I can't believe that that's gonna be a good conduit over the long run, maybe not even over the short run. Steve, any thoughts? Well, a specific patient population is the very elderly, and um, particularly an elderly woman who may have had uh, vein stripping earlier in her, in her life. And I think in, that's one group where we use bilateral radials. And I think that uh, um, whereas some surgeons do use bilateral radials more regularly, I think there is a downside, and, but I think that's one group where um, bilateral radials do make sense. And what, just since we're talking about radials, one specific question, how do you uh, ensure that you'll not have uh, ischemic injury to the hand when you're harvesting radial? Yeah. So uh, routinely we do a modified Allens, and I think that's probably even more, even better than the, uh, the lab tests that we do, but we do send them for digital plaque mismography. And that also does give a, a duplex evaluation of the radial, so you know how big it is when you're starting as well as the quality. But frequently, uh, I find the clinical exam is a, a better determinant than the uh, lab tests. And then finally, if there is some concern or the, the test results are discordant, we'll uh, do an intraoperative test with, a, with an O2 probe in the hand and occlude the radial artery. Joe, how do you? Uh, we do the same. Okay. So two final questions. One, skeletonized or non-skeletonized, does it matter? I think it does matter. And we routinely use skeletonized mammaries, particularly when we're doing bilateral internal mammary arteries. I think you never, ever, ever want to take a large pedicle 
And so if you're not taking it skeletonized, it should be a, a small pedicle. I do believe that affects wound healing and decreases wound infection. Steve, also? Uh, we're still more conservative. Um, um, I think that, uh, but for diabetics, it does make sense. Um, there are some technical things that can make harvesting of the uh, skeletonized mammary easier. Um, harmonic scalpel, for example. Um, in our institution, it still takes longer to take both. However, having said that, if we are to take uh, a skeletonized mammary, we're usually interested in taking the right one skeletonized again because that makes the right mammary more versatile in reaching the target. Great, thank you. So final question, predictions. Um, where in your estimation are we now in terms of use of uh, total arterial and where will we be in 10 years? Well, I think we're pretty low now. We know that uh, bilateral internal mammary artery usage, at least in the STS database, is you know, well under 10%, maybe uh, 4 to 5%, which I think is very disappointing. But I do have to believe that uh, a coronary artery uh, surgery is becoming more of a specialty, just like mitral valve surgery, aortic surgery. And it will focus on surgeons who are, who are very interested in coronary vascularization and very interested in arterial grafting. I believe it will go up. I don't think it will get there as quickly as we would like, but I uh, believe that uh, arterial grafting will continue to increase. Steve, what's your prediction? Yeah, I think that increased arterial revascularization will happen. Total arterial revascularization, I think, is a, a bigger step. Um, however, I think for the patient's perspective that even increased arterial revascularization would make a big difference. Great. Any final thoughts? No. Great. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank my colleagues for a very informative session, and I uh, hope our uh, viewership uh, was as well informed as uh, as we were. Thank you. <laughs>